Oh, great. Almond flour, I thought. As I put a small bag, almond flour, sealed uh, this bag of white powder into my larger grocery bag. Now, to be clear, I don't bake very often. I've made bread every now and again. I do know my way around a kitchen, but almond flour. What would anyone make with almond flour? Well, it, was, it was an act of desperation. I told myself, it's food. If things get bad, it's food. It has carbohydrates. It has calories. I can mix it with eggs and yeast. Make some kind of biscuit or bread or whatever. It has a long shelf life. After all, this is survival. And so if you wanted to know, my need to buy a bag of almond flour was the moment that I knew the pandemic had arrived. I remember the scene well, standing in front of empty grocery store shelves earlier in March, coincidentally on Friday the 13th. No all-purpose flour was to be had in the entire store. The run on food at the grocery was, well, it was worse than a snow day in the south. I could see folks were in a rush, but I wondered how panicked I should be. Later in the day is when I would learn that our school didn't want the children to return on Monday. At that point, it was only for two weeks. And likewise, that e evening, the session and I communicated and consulted around closing worship in the sanctuary only for two Sundays, just to see how things would go. Then six feet became a rule. Wearing masks went from optional to mandatory. There was red, yellow, and green, and then the latest restriction du jour. Our school children learned from home only to return to their buildings in a few days to come. Weeks turned into months as a time of hardship changed the social and economic fabric of our community. Though we took a hiatus from worshiping in the sanctuary, the church never closed. And here we are, we're back, but we are wearing masks, worshiping online with a, a new normal in a fluid and changing landscape. So I don't know about you, but you know, I could really go for some precedented times right about now. <laughs> to consider the immense weight that comes with our present days, we happen upon an epic story in Scripture, an encounter of the Lord's protection during a pivotal moment in history. Now, after his theatrical encounter with a burning bush, Moses' return to Pharaoh comes with an equally dramatic series of plagues upon Egypt. From his staff, every drop of water in the land turns to blood. After the blood come the frogs, which team the river Nile, the lifeline of the empire. After the frogs was an infestation of lice. Next were the wild animals, which harmed the livestock. Now, Pharaoh almost relented on this one. But then when Pharaoh hardened his heart, a pestilence came upon the horses and the donkeys and the cattle and the sheep. Then, since the sickness of the animals was not enough, surely Pharaoh would take note of the boils that followed on people's skin. Thunderstorms of hail and fire came next to try to change Pharaoh's mind, but to no avail. A scourge of locusts blanketed the land, eating the trees, the plants, and the grain in the storehouses. Nevertheless, the destruction was still not enough to change Pharaoh's mind. So the sun did not come up for three days. 
a warning of portents in the heavens. Only after nine ominous plagues did the Lord come to the last straw. What more could be taken from the Egyptians for Pharaoh to relent? And the term Passover is taken literally. The Lord passed over the homes of the Israelites as their firstborns survived the wrath of God. And as this occurs, the Israelite community worships. They come together to worship the Lord. They come together as a community to arrange their rituals. They pack and they prepare, working in the ways that God instructs them. They're identifying claims of their patterns and their works and the ways that they come together claim that identity as the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as, a, as Israel's family, who will no longer remain in captivity. Ready to go, they are a people destined for a kingdom. And so for them, grace comes through the blood of a lamb. Breaking bread with the urgency of expected leaving, even before the bread is able to rise. Sit with your shoes on. Eat quickly with your walking stick in your hand, ready to go. Unprecedented for sure. And God's path ahead, a new beginning is at hand. Now, you may be one in a moment of reflection who ponders the many life-changing events that all of us have come to know recently. For me, looking back, ask the question, what have we taught ourselves in making our way through this new time? Well, the metaphor of an exodus, departing one place for an unknown future, brings to mind the importance of trusting in God as displaced people learned how to shape and reshape their lives through the journey. For the Israelites, an exodus provides the courageous awareness of looking ahead rather than turning back to the past. New leaders replace old masters, and the community begins to see itself with a new sense of being. I wonder if we could say the same about our pandemic time. Are we charging ahead, confident and without fear? Or... Are interruptions so frustrating that normalcy is coveted, is as coveted as a, quen as a quenching drop of water amidst a barren and thirsty desert? The unsettling news of hot spots and rising cases are quelled only with more separation, more caution, more suspicion. Are we making any headway? Has our goal come any closer? Inevitably, as we go, not everything will go according to plan. And so one hand becomes disconnected from the other. Hoped for patterns of refreshing renewal find the cumbersome implementation of asking who will step up to take on those new tasks that need to be done. Disrupted is the comfort of orderly patterns, forced instead to find capability through inspiration, creativity, and ingenuity. And yet the hope I hold on to during an unprecedented time reminds me that in reflecting upon God's story of departure from ordinary life, the Israelites provide you and me a fruitful reminder that we've been here before. Now, it occurs to me that God's people in the subsequent church that came to believe have a story that repeatedly finds itself in trouble. 
And despite our challenges, our community of faith continues to see its way through those times of challenge together. Back at the church's beginning, in the book of Acts, when having received complaints about the distribution of resources, the apostles responded by rethinking their community, clarifying roles, realigning the work. In 313, when the Emperor Constantine took control of the Roman Empire, ending the persecutions of Nero, a double-edged sword challenged the church to keep its faith while living in an inferior position to the power of a ruler. Subsequently, the monastic movement was created as a means of protest, withdrawing from alignment with the state. In 1050, intense clashes among the Normans and Vikings made Italian families powerful in their control upon the Roman Catholic Church. Gregorian monks led the charge in creating change among such a deep need for reform, and they strengthened papal authority, resolving disputes from a top-down approach. In the early 16th century, never before had so many priests and church members abandoned the traditional line of the church's indulgent prescriptions. The resulting protesting reformers, known as Protestants, sought equality in the ability to read scripture for themselves. Changes here resulted in a Protestant Reformation and in time significant reforms among the Roman Catholic Church occurred as well. The church had to work its way through the so-called liberalism movement of the late 19th century as two great awakenings and political revolutions in France and those in the British, those British colonies in the Americas spurred on the, rising, the, the rise of valuing individual freedom. A philosophy stressing the rights of human dignity forced a challenge among the relationship between the church and the culture. And finally, the religious progressions of the 20th century have seen a church that has become more inclusive of the individual as well as other denominations and expressions of Christian faith with a broader scope of God's handiwork moving among us. The Second Vatican Council and subsequent ecumenical movement among Protestant denominations has provided a lasting impact on the ways that God's church of all different strains are able to understand ourselves as the whole body of God. And so amid our time, amid our struggles and the challenging and difficult circumstances that we find ourselves in, we go back only to see that it is God who has moved God's people along. They are on the move, looking forward, And as we look at them, we see that there is further proof that we are not alone. The church has been here before. And for the times ahead, I hope to find some comfort in remembering God's story with us, rehearsing these preceding times of significant change that our faithful forebears endured as well. Possibly, then is the presence of remembering that we are not alone. You and I together are just as unsure as they were. We know that we will make mistakes, we will make big ones, and we will learn, and then we will pray, and we will move on to the next day, resting each evening with the assurance that our guiding voice comes from the Spirit, the author and the giver of life. And so for those times when it appears that our circumstances will never change, I hope that we will look to the Israelites who worshipped God with unleavened bread, walking sticks in hand, our move forward 
will only speed along God's plans. And for the times when I get frustrated with masks and distancing and the inability to shake hands, help me find the patience in also remembering that Christians have endured far worse for the sake of sharing God's love with the world. And when the road is unclear, the pathway forward foggy, and there is no particular direction in sight, I hope that you and I together will remember the ways God's chosen people have lived, served, and grown through challenging experiences as we usher in the kingdom of God, God's presence among us. We've been here before, says the story. And we go with the courage to ask and to find, how is God growing the church today? Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.